Welcome to How I Generate It. I'm Mike, and I talk to people who are pushing the boundaries of storytelling using AI. In this episode, I'll be talking with Tasha Caulfield. Tasha is a writer and filmmaker who uses AI to tell stories about cultural icons, forgotten historic moments, and the world of her own imagination. We chat about her journey into AI, the motivation behind the types of stories she chooses to tell, and of course, how she generates it. Thank you for listening. Here's my interview with Tasha Caulfield. Welcome to the show, Tasha. Hello. How are you? Good, good. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I get the sense that you were a creative person doing lots of things, and at some point you discovered AI um, and mm -hmm. you just took to it. We've never spoken until like two minutes ago, but just like when I look at your videos and stuff like that, this is just the sense that I get. Could you talk about your process of like, how did you discover AI stuff and, and what did draw you to it? Um, I think, you know, like a lot of people before I, you know, really dove into it, you, you kind of hear about it a little bit. And I think it was uh, like the metaverse or something that first caught my eye as far as like, ooh, you can possibly be able to tell stories in that world or whatever. But then there was like a video of Mark Zuckerberg's butt and it was, <laughs> and it was like, you can't, <laughs> you can't do bottoms really. And I'm like, all right, so the tech isn't really there yet. But to go back a little further, so I've been writing forever. I started at about 14 years old and I had mentors in Hollywood. I started writing sitcoms first with my mentors because they were sitcom writers and producers. But we would write everything, screenplays, short stories, poems, all that kind of stuff. And with screenplays, I kept putting camera directions in, and you're not supposed to do that. So I decided to go to film school to become a director, um, and that's you know how I started with all that kind of stuff. So I went to USC Film, Warner Brothers, read some stuff I wrote, paid, and I started um, you know down the Hollywood path and going into that world and working there. But I'm not really into corporate environments, and I wanted to write in a different way. Like I wanted to write like with a lot of life experience and all that kind of stuff behind it. I'm really influenced by things like Cool Hand Luke and A River Runs Through It and stuff like that. So I, I kind of ran off to go actually live a life and opposed to just staying in Hollywood and working there. And I was writing though after a while during that time, fiction novels, like you said, and nonfiction novels. And, and I did stand up and I'm doing documentaries and, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm still being creative. But when AI came out, it was kind of like full circle. And I was like, oh, I get to tell these stories. I get to create films and I don't have to operate within the corporate structure of Hollywood. So it was a perfect blend for me. Yeah. And I think that's great because, um, it, it sounds like you're someone who's very creative, has a lot of um, ways that you can be creative, mm -hmm. um, but there hasn't really been like this one channel that you can go to to bring it all together. Or there is a channel, but it's really like highly, you know, there's a lot of gatekeepers. There's that corporate culture that you mentioned where it's like you've got to kind of like earn your way into it. And a lot of times that means like you have to have like a family member in or something like that or... Um, well, and I, I think it's really interesting. I never, well, yeah, I've, go ahead. I've already earned my way into it. It's and you know, and the people that are talking to me now in Hollywood are kind of trying to discourage me from not from staying away from Hollywood. So that's that wasn't my problem. My problem mm -hmm. is more um, that I just I like being super independent as an artist. I, I like to only create things I'm really passionate about. I don't like to work on anything that I'm not inspired to work on at the time. And I'm a recluse a little bit, <laughs> and a loner. Mm -hmm. And so for me, especially like being a massive introvert, um, this, this works well. And that's what I think is so great about AI too, is that for a lot of introverts, they're finally going to be able to create these big projects that otherwise, you know, they would have been shut out from just because of the nature of their personality or just the way they like to work. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I bet that being an introvert helps you a lot create your stuff. Because I imagine this takes a long time to create some of your your videos. It seems like there's so many, there's so much that goes into the scripting, it seems, and so much that all of the different shots and motion that goes in. If you could just kind of walk us through your process, like where does this start? So l let me back up for one second. Let me set the stage for the first one that I saw from you. I know it's not your first video, but the first one that I saw from you is called The Phenomenal Woman 
which mm-hmm. is um, a biopic of Maya Angelou. I didn't know a ton about her life. I knew her as a public figure who was this highly respected poet and, and writer, but it, it seemed like her whole life and the things that made her who she is all happened before she came onto my radar. So she was already mm-hmm. kind of fully formed in my mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when I saw your uh, short um, AI movie about her, it was like, wow, I had no idea. Like this was like, there was, everything was eye-opening. And I like, pulled up Wikipedia. I'm like, wow, this is amazing, you know? Mm. If we start with that one, how did you begin with that story? Um, how did you generate it? Um, well, with that one, uh, <laughs> that's such a big question. But um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the first prompt? How is that easier? Like, where, like, did you go to no, like help no, get prompting it, it on the starts, story? Or? No, it always starts with the script for me. I mean, I still use yellow pads. Like, I like I'm a I'm a writer, <laughs> and mm-hmm. um, so yeah, so I I create, so I create a a trailer. I kind of know things I want to highlight from her life, and then I find ways that. Um, you know, like snippets that I that can kind of express that and just and do it chronologically, of course, like as far as how her life went. So then after that, I'll, you know, I, I might create a shot list in chat GPT just in case I don't want to um, just, you know, just to, to maybe write it out as far as um, like take the script and put it in and say create a shot list from this. And um, but I never end up looking at it. I usually just go through the screenplay and write next to it because this the chat the uh, shot list that chat GBT will give. It'll just be like she's in a room, um, you know, <laughs> she's in a yeah. room looking at the. Ca- I'm like, yeah, I, I know that. So like everything it's saying is stuff that I already know. Like it's it's just saying what's happening, but putting numbers next to it really. So I'm like, okay. Um, so, and normally at this point you, you'd storyboard it. And if I'm doing something in like a Hollywood situation or something where I'm working with other people, um, you definitely would probably have to do that. But fortunately, since I'm doing it alone, I can just write next to it, next to scenes, how I want it to look, what angle, or just if I want some sort of, or, or, you know, what images I want to reflect what's being said. That's how I mm-hmm. kind of approach that part of it. So it starts for you with the script. So you write yeah, the script, always. you might paste that script into chat GPT or something, say, hey, give me a shot list. Usually yeah. you might get like one or two good ideas out of that, but it's just kind of like a way to make sure that you're on the right track, it sounds like. Yeah, and um, I did that but- for like the first two things I did. I don't really do it anymore, but that's kind of when I started Mm -hmm. just to see if I was missing anything or if I would be like, you know what I mean? Just like to see how, what AI had to say about my process (laughs) and if I was, and if they had anything to add to it, which in that situation for me, but you know, it doesn't really, but it, it could be a way to stay organized because my scripts end up looking like crap afterwards. It's just writing all over it. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that's great. And then so you, you get the script down, you have your shot list, um, and then then where do you bring that? Where is, what's your image generator that you're using? Um, Mid Journey is a big one for Hangman. I, I did that mostly with uh, Leonardo, but I usually start with Mid Journey, and then sometimes I'll take it to Leonardo just to get a little bit more of a filmic look um, and you know have it at 90 as far as the image reflection goes, or if the hands are weird or something, I might bring it down so that Leonardo will clean it up. So I'll go from mid journey to Leonardo. Um, but if Leonardo changes too much of it, then I'll, and, and just takes away a little bit of the character or the creativity that mid journey had, especially when I'm looking at people. Um, sometimes it might change it too much or, or just the person's a lot more interesting in mid journey. So sometimes I'll stick with the mid journey image um, and up res that. But usually if I stick with the mid journey, that's where I'll get a little bit more of a rubbery cartoony kind of thing. But for me, it's worth it just to have that expression a little bit more in the character because Leonardo, the characters a lot of times uh, tend to be a little bit more uh, modely, like a lot of models. Um, <laughs> and so, and so it's kind of like, you know, you want a little, and Majority just has more of a range of, um, of, of faces and stuff like that. Have you ever tried putting an ugly person into a generator? I've, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> like prompt for an ugly yeah, person. Yes, I'm prompting for ugly people. 
<laughs> it's so what, sad. What, did it, what happened? <laughs> oh, well, are they not? <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, Leonardo has like a lot of models. So a lot of the people they were saying were ugly were like, you're like, that's not that bad. Like, <laughs> I hope that person <laughs> never sees this. <laughs> but that's just a beautiful person scowling. That's <laughs> yes, not like an exactly, ugly person. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, Mid journey will give you a little bit more range. That's good. <laughs> I have my one that is always funny to me. is like if I'm trying to like generate a male character, I always have to put a, uh, a negative prompt in for brooding because it's like mm. they always have like the men brooding, like everyone yeah. looks like they're angry about something. So it's yeah. like, well, in this case, this character is not angry. So I have to like you have to negative prompt that way, too. There's yeah, so many funny things with the models. Yeah. It is. And even just like I noticed. Um, so if I, you know, making the Maya Angelou pick, like you said, um, putting in like black person in the 1940s whatever like everyone was in like the poorest conditions it was, it was like they yeah. were it was like they were homeless people that just happened to find a home somewhere i was like you know the walls were always peeling <laughs> like it was just so sad <laughs> so i had to like i had to write like you know in a rich home and stuff like that just to um not you know, just to not be stereotypical with it because um, Maya Angelou's mother actually was a landlord and owned property and all that kind of stuff. And her grandmother had the most successful convenience store uh, in the in the community. So it wasn't like these were dirt poor, you know, places. I think her mom, the, the home they were in was like a 12 bedroom home and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's weird. I feel like you've done a couple interesting things to get around some of the shortcomings of AI. And for this one, I feel like one of them is consistent characters. And I like the fact that you were able to take Maya at different stages in life. And that way you're not necessarily, it's the same person, but it's not necessarily the same exact character each time. You know, you see her when she's a little girl and when she's, you know, older and when she's working in the club and things like that. So... Um, how intentional, like, was that just kind of something that, that happened because of the nature of the biopic? Or were you like, hey, I want to do this because I can, you know, work around this shortcoming? Well, that was like one of the hardest things to do with that, because you're trying to show, you're trying to have a consistent character, but yet she's, um, you know, mute for a little bit over five years. So you're, you're trying to show her grow, like aging, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's like the 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 prompting is really all over the place as far as what you get back um, when you're like, could she be 12 now? Could she be 13? You know, and so, you know, so that was really tough. And at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I had one character that I stuck with that I just kind of, you know, kept doing and then shots that when I would watch back and I would just be like, who the hell is that? <laughs> then I'd get rid of that and try to, you know, replace it at least to where I'm like, okay, this is pretty close to it. Yeah. But yeah, I use um, <laughs> the C ref a lot. That's that's kind of my go to. I, I was going to ask that because. Yeah, I try to in swapper, but in swapper doesn't work as well. And then when you have multiple people in a scene, um, of course, that's not great. So in swap. Uh, so C ref a lot and um, face fusion and Pinocchio. Um, that's also a good option. And for those people who don't know, C ref is like a command in mid journey where you can create a character and then um, you use that URL, right? So you take, you can take like, mm -hmm. is it like three different images of a character and put dash dash C ref and then paste those URLs in and then it will kind of use whatever prompt you use. It'll try and use that character in the scene. And there's a ton of tutorials and stuff like that. Yeah, and then dash it, dash but, CW um, for character weight. So C ref is character reference and the CW is how much you want the character to look like you know, the, like the exact picture. So if you want them to wear the same clothes, you can leave it alone or put it at like 100. But if you want them to change outfits or things like that, then you might crank it down to 50 or 25, the character weight. Very cool. Mm -hmm. and, and have you done that? Have you been able to use that for all of the movies that mm -hmm. you've made? Because I think that's kind of, okay, that's good. Because I know it was <laughs> something that didn't exist for a while. Yeah. And everyone's like, we need more character consistency. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's you could still do it with face fusion, um, but yeah, like yeah, that was, I haven't that was used really face helpful. fusion before. Yeah, what? So how how do you use or how have you used face fusion? And tell me a little bit about what it is because I actually don't know. 
So face fusion, um, and I access it through Pinocchio because it's a lot easier, um, is you basically swap out a person's face for another person or whatever. And a lot of, like a lot of the things that the mainstream companies are doing have, have been around with all that kind of stuff. And like, so what I studied was a lot of the best um, people who were doing the bad stuff in AI, like, you know, faking, <laughs> faking pre mm -hmm. presidents talking and stuff like that. Yeah. But they were actually using really helpful tools. And so face fusion is a big one that they use to swap out um, the faces for another in exchange. And a lot of that stuff, you know, comes in handy, too. If a face gets too messed up in one of the image generators, um, you can always take that image and go into face fusion and swap it out. It does a pretty good job. And it also added... Um, wave to lip and some other lip syncs to it. So I use that a lot. It sounds like it's an open source tool because you mentioned Pinocchio, yeah. which I think is a way of installing open source kind of tools. So very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, um, so you figure out your shot list, you've created the consistent characters. Um, and then how do you, how do you bring this to life? There's camera movements and things like that and voiceover, but then there's also characters talking in it. So if you could just kind of go into that next step. Yeah. The, I mean, the things I do simultaneously are probably, uh, the up resing where you up the resolution and something like a Topaz product, like Gigapixel, but, I, uh, Magnific, you can also use a Crea or something like that. So I'll probably do that simultaneously with creating images and mid-journey and stuff like that. And then also I save the lip sync and all that kind of stuff um, for after everything is l laid out in the editing timeline, just because I might not use something. When I'm editing, the people will be silent. The, the voices will be under them, but it'll just them be moving and you won't see their lips move. And then I'll um, add the lip sync later. And so for lip sync, I use a lot of the, the face fusion in Pinocchio, because that's helpful. Um, that it handles darker situations a little bit better. It handles angles a little bit better. And it handles multiple people in a scene better than something like uh, Runway or, or whatever. But Runway will give you a little bit of a better look with the lips. Um, but, you know, sometimes it, won't, it won't do a lot of... Uh, a lot of that other stuff I just talked about. And it's, you know, it could be a little censored, which is, which is weird. And that's one of the things that's nice about using Pinocchio is that, you know, since it's open source and it's kind of out there, you can do whatever and not have to worry about all the censorship that comes with like mid journey and stuff like that. Cause even the opening scene with um, Maya Angelou where she had the incident that made her become mute cause she spoke about it and the guy got killed and she felt that her voice you know, like talking could kill people. So she, as a child, that's was her logic and she went mute, but I couldn't really show that scene in any, you know, in anything. So I just kind of had to allude to it. Not that I would have done it in a crude way or anything like that, but mm -hmm. you know, I, so yeah. So the censorship is, they're getting better though. I mean, almost too better. I'm getting a lot of nipples in mid journey now for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> for no reason. Yeah. For no reason. Like, I'm like, I don't like, why is her shirt open? I don't get it. <laughs> 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 the very common problem with like a lot of AI tools make women as sexy as possible all the time regardless is that of what that is yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like it is yeah um but in the so it's interesting when you're when you're talking about like bringing it into runway I know one thing it doesn't do good with angles they really have to be mm -hmm. facing forward and I know in some of yours you have characters talking and they are at an angle and it works mm -hmm. Your most recent one um, with the Dave Chappelle oh, story. I mean, I imagine there's like that is just loaded with stuff <laughs> that probably you is could not. <laughs> yes, it's not appropriate. Um, but then yes. you just run it through again and they'll say it and you're like, OK, I don't know what that was about. But um, yeah. And the other one I use, too, is DID a lot, especially if the mm. person's not moving um, that that one. But their head is also wobbly a little bit. But sometimes if runway won't give it to you and face fusion is just a little funky, then DID could be an option. Hey Jen, I've also used a little bit, but their pricing structure is not really conducive to what we do. I think they're more for like corporate stuff where they do it mm -hmm. all the time, every day. I mean, it's like $40 a month or something. It's just like, I just want one line. So it's kind of like not worth it for yeah. me. But yeah. Yeah, it seems like that's like if you want to do like 40 corporate presentations yeah. in like different languages or something, like that's a great yeah. tool. But if but you're trying to am, yeah. get this perfect cinematic shot, it's not as much. Yeah. Yeah, but they do an amazing job, but it's just the prices for me is not worth it. I mean, if I were working on something 
big than um, meaning somebody else is paying for it, then <laughs> yeah, I'd do I'd use it, but not for me. But so far, what you've had done with AI, just to recap, is like you, you may have gotten some tips on the shot list from ChatGPT. You've generated images in Midjourney. You've animated those in a variety of different tools, from Leonardo to Runway to Mostly DID. Pixverse. To I don't really like. I don't. Pixverse. Yeah. yeah, I. That's my go-to. I use it for ninety, ninety-five percent of uh, the shots. I'll use a little bit of Leonardo, which is not great, but sometimes they'll give you something good, especially if a human's not in it, like an airplane taking off. And runway, when I want to get super specific on something, I can use the motion brush there. But, um, you know, and every, I think everybody hates Pixverse. <laughs> but, and that's one thing that's interesting about the image generators is people get different, some, like people have success with stuff that you're just like, I mean, I see stuff from Hyper and I'm like, that is not what I get. Like, what are you guys doing? Or, you know, people probably mm -hmm. would think about that with me with Pixverse. It's like, I, you know, da, da, da. And they, they, even this past week, they've created a little bit more to help control the image from the prompting to how much you want the motion to the angles. So they're c constantly improving. There's things where I'm just like, you know, everybody's using their picks, pick a, I'm like, how are you guys getting that? Because when I do it, everybody just gets, just runs off. Like all my characters just <laughs> run away or something. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I was just doing something in Pika last night. And it's almost like there's someone who ran into the shot in the background. I'm like, where, <laughs> yeah. why did that person show up? Yeah, like, where were they a, coming from? Yeah, there's a lot of random people just kind of, you know, photo bombing or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Images. <up. laughs> in terms of like, I mentioned the storytelling piece of it before, like, it seems like you're such a great storyteller. And that's really driving why you're making some of these. So I want to ask you about one of the ones that we haven't mentioned yet which is called Playing on Defense. And this is the one that came out after The Phenomenal Woman, I believe. So what drew you to telling this story? Like, what was your connection to this story? Because it was, for me, it's like an odd choice to follow up Maya Angelou with this character. So tell me a little bit, well, who, why, well, who is the is subject of this? Why is it an odd choice, this? Mike? <laughs> no, go ahead. I, no, I, why is it an to odd me choice? It's, I'm just curious. To, to me, it's, uh, so I'm going to say, it's James McAfee. And the reason why, if, if you don't know who that is, it's the person who did the virus software, antivirus software, I should mm -hmm. say. Like usually when you think of like tech people, you see the people who are building, you know, the, the Steve Jobs, Bill Gates kind of people. And to me, this was like a really interesting choice because it's someone who's building this thing that like the title says on the defense, someone who you don't even think about. It's this thing that's running in the background and the only thing I really know about him is towards the end of his life, there was like a lot of drama. I don't remember all the details about it, but it was just sort of like this, wow, this is really strange, you know? Yeah. So um, it, it was, it felt to me like there, like you had some sort of connection to this story or there was something that intrigued you about this. Um, and when I was watching it, it was like, wow, there's, it's really kind of interesting how it's a different view of the early days of, computing like that moment there's a moment in the trailer where they first realize about you know viruses like computer viruses it, mm -hmm. it's hard for people to imagine now but there's a time where it was like <laughs> people were just using computers and then it's like hey there's this virus that could actually take down all of these computers and there was a time where that was the first time it happened and that's kind of a little bit i think what your trailer alludes to well you're uh, explaining so what, what it was that, that's my <laughs> summary of it <laughs> so what, what's your interesting story um, yeah, yeah, well, I chose it like pretty much for the same reason that I chose my Angelo or, or with this latest thing, whatever I, you know, I like uh, people who've done really interesting things, number one, and have really interesting stories, but I also like exploring the side of a person's story that, that people are missing when it's usually a big part of who it is, you know, like my Angelo is this saint or whatever in reality, you know, her, a lot of her journey was what a lot of young girls deal with and you can't you when when you have these like one dimensional characters we do ourselves a disservice as far as how we view ourselves we expect perfection from ourselves and we don't love all these different facets of it so with uh, the James McAfee piece and his stories definitely has never been told in a way that does justice to a person who is so integral 
to our, our modern day life. And so I got to highlight the genius of it. And also, you know, hearing him talk about his story and that specific moment in time and him saying that that was the most exciting time of his life, you know, that really helped motivate me to really focus on that. Ultimately, everything I do is always about unconditional love that's kind of behind all my writing and everything trying to support people and loving themselves unconditionally so I like to mm-hmm. have characters I like to show that you know both sides of every body the dark and the light because to me that's kind of a helpful way to get people to uh, love themselves more mm-hmm. absolutely you mentioned something that, like that in the description too or maybe it's in one of the um, screen credit things But like where it's about like, even if you have a troubled life, you know, even if there's like trouble in your life and that's the sense that. You should read my YouTube descriptions. I don't think anybody reads those. (laughs) I read them. (laughs) Yeah. I uh, I get really interested in, um, you know, understand, like when I see, and, and to me, when I said like it was an unusual choice, it's, I think that's the reason is like, if this were a Hollywood movie, there would be like a major star attached and you would be like, oh, it's this, you know, this major star playing this historical figure in the world of AI it's like it's James McAfee you know it's like it's Mm. the person it's someone who resembles him in a normal movie you can say oh this star chose this biopic because there's some sort of like Oscar worthy story behind it Mm -hmm. and when you're watching an AI movie like yours for me it was like I was discovering all of this stuff while I was watching it so I thought that was a really um, cool way to bring that to life as I was watching the trailer I was like oh this is a lot more dramatic than I imagined yeah, when you're creating something like that, it helps to be really committed to the the story, the characters or whatever, and not try to put your own stuff on Twitter, your own beliefs. Um, and so that's, what, you know, creating something like playing on the defense after the Maya Angelou pick, if it, it's a reflection of how I'm committed to a storytelling and, and interesting people and interesting stories and things like that. Because, you know, you get questioned. I got people DMing me, oh, are you a libertarian? Da, da, da. You know, stuff like that. I didn't get nobody complaining when Obama put, you know, a thing around my Angela's neck. But then all of a sudden, you know, people are trying to figure out um, what's, what's your angle here because they're not used to real artists anymore. They're used to a lot of propaganda. So, you know, for me, it's going to take a lot longer for people to understand that you're committed to, to, to art, to, to telling people's story, which is just, you know, in my opinion, a reflection. You're holding a mirror up to society or, and, and you don't have a dog in the race or anything like that, um, opposed to, you know, the thin line of crossing over to propaganda. It's going to take a while for people to trust you and to, um, and to understand what you're doing. So you have to, you know, have a little bit of courage to, to, to be committed to doing that. Yeah. And, and I think that commitment to storytelling and telling stories that are maybe uncomfortable for people too, which I think is something that you do really well. Like the one that you posted, it's, well, it's today as we're recording this, but like your most recent one, when I started watching that, it definitely, it's, so just for people who haven't seen it, it's called, well, the short version is Grio. Actually, can you give the title, the full title? I have it up in front of me. But. Yes, Grio, um, which, you know, spelled with a T, but it's uh, Grio. And I have a recurring nightmare where I misspell it um, <laughs> in the film, and I, and I do it everywhere. <laughs> I misspell it everywhere. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, it's called Grio, um, the greatest story Dave Chappelle ever retold, or Grio, the Adventures of Iceberg Slim. Yeah. And it was, so I've never heard this story before. And it was like, it starts off pretty um, graphically and pretty intense, but it really is like this great story by the time you get through the whole thing with a great twist ending. And it was like, what I love is, I'm sure he's told this story on stage just as a story, but you were able to bring it to life and kind of um, show a certain era. You're getting into these old costumes and this old style of cars and things like that. So I thought it was really a compelling way to show that story. Um, but it is the kind of story that can make you feel uncomfortable as oh. you're watching it, you know, as a, as a viewer. And I you feel like yeah? we, I feel like a lot of times people shy away from that stuff now. Like we don't lean yeah. into like the difficult stories. Mm-hmm. And I like the fact that you do lean into those um, difficult stories. So what, what drew you to that one? Well, if it's difficult to watch, or especially the beginning part of it, um, imagine having <laughs> imagine how difficult it was for me <laughs> to have to read the book, to do the oh. research, um, listen to 
uh, you know, ladies of the night and the guys who manage them, um, listen to them talk and go into their world and stuff like that. And actually the people, the characters I used to voice uh, those in Eleven Labs um, are actual people that are in that profession. Um, because I learned um, that, you know, it's it's really hard to find someone who could sound. And it's, you know, and I, I thought about actually making their voices clearer and, and not using Chappelle's voice over it. Um, but it was, to me, it was, it didn't really work that way. But, um, but yeah, I had to, so yeah, I, like I said, when I announced that I was doing, it, I'm like, I had to, I was in the fetal position in a way. Like, I was like, oh my God, this is awful. <laughs> yeah, but, um, yeah. but it was, it's, it's worth it. And especially when I saw, um, one of the girls, um, ladies of the night kind of crying and talking about how, you know, she wished that there was more opportunities to connect, um, you know, like with in interviews, like the person who was interviewing her, she was thanking him so much for, um, just interviewing her and being and interviewing that world in a soft underbelly, a white soft underbelly, mm -hmm. just because they don't really have that, you know, that connection with the rest of the world. Um, so that was kind of a big motivator too, to to go ahead with the project. So the the thing is about capitalism, and you know, Dave Chabelle talks about it in the Bird Revelation and just why he left Hollywood and went to Africa, and and so you know, but you know, it's phrasing it in the Grio thing. That was my idea. <laughs> mm, and, I like, uh, I like yeah. it. You mentioned you you list yourself as a griot in the credits too, which I was like, yeah. oh, that was such a good touch. I love it's that. It's bold. It's bold. Yeah. Fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, I've written books and stuff, and just even with the, what I'm doing in AI, you know, telling these, continuing to tell these stories and stuff like that. You know, griot is the, the, a storyteller that you know when they, as Chappelle said, it's like they say when the person dies, it's like a library was burned down. So, you know, kind of keeping in that tradition. But, um, but yeah, I was like, ooh, like, <laughs> you bold, girl. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, that but was, it was, it was, it's, it's, it's dark. And like you said, a lot of people aren't going there. And I think even in Hollywood, maybe Scorsese is the only person that really kind of could, you know, is still going there for the most part. Um, but, yeah, there's some harsh truths out there. There's some, there's some dark stories. But it's life, you know, it's we, you know, it's a spectrum. As Maya Angela said, I'm a human, therefore nothing human could be alien to me. And when you cut yourself off from certain aspects of it, you cut yourself off from certain aspects of humanity. You don't fit, you don't feel the full spectrum of things. You don't experience the full spectrum of things. So, you know, I, I, I go there, but I don't live there. You know, it's, that's mm -hmm. the difference. I love that. That's great. Thank you. And when I see stuff like that, it, it's just so powerful that then, like when you see another one on Reddit, that's like this movie and this style of movie. And it's like, okay, like mm. this is cool. But I feel like the stuff that you're saying, what I like about it is it has a, a perspective and a storytelling. So it's very well, cool. Thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about the Grio movie was you have these tricks that you do sometimes or things that I noticed. I was like, oh, that was a really smart thing. You have Dave Chappelle telling the story. And then there's points when the character is talking and they're both talking. And what's really cool about it is that like the character is almost speaking with Dave Chappelle's voice and the character's voice. So you don't really notice the AI-ness of it, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah, that's, that's a good that point. Cool. Yeah. So this question um, came from a comment on a previous one. I think people want to know... You know, a lot of people are creating content and you see lots of videos going hundreds of thousands, millions of views and stuff that are created with AI. And I think a lot of people have had this, the feeling like they create something and it doesn't have this like massive viral video following or, or views. Um, when that kind of thing happens, how do you feel motivated to, to make another one? Um, well, you know, you create because you enjoy creating. You love the work. I mean, that's that's the sh short answer. <laughs> that's the direct answer. Uh, <laughs> that's but, the answer. Yeah. yeah, but um, you can't really control the other stuff. And if you want to be happy in this world, in this life, the first rule is to only focus on things that you can control, number one, but then also recognize that, you know, it's, it's, it's all in your head and, and you could choose thoughts that make you feel better. But Outside of that, you know, it's it's really just about enjoying the work. You do it because you, you have to. Like, it's you don't really have an option to be creative um, and to express yourself in a certain way. You do, but you'll feel like 
you won't feel right. Like it'll eat at you. And I've tried, I've tried living, not writing, believe it or not. <laughs> As an adult. And that, that, that did not go well. I, but, but yeah, so, but yeah, you can try, but at the end of the day, it's just, it's something you have to do. You just have to do it. But I also think that you'd be a good person to answer that question because, um, you've been at it for, uh, a long time. And I, you know, even seeing your GTA video, and just how you oh, were, sque- yeah. yeah, and just how you were squeaking out stories um, with with that tech and how limited that is. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I'm I'm inspired watching you. I'm just like, man, this guy is committed to just just the art, like just just creating stuff. Um, and also, I mean, it's great that you're teaching now and helping that. But um, yeah, so like, I think yeah. you'd be a good person to answer that. Yeah, yeah, I. I... I'm glad that you saw the Grand Theft Auto <laughs> movie. That's like, <laughs> I, I feel like that's like 15 years old that I made with like a very early version of text to voice and the Grand Theft old. Auto game. Just like <laughs> recording is, oh my God. Um, just recording, you know, game footage and then putting it together and stuff. One of my most popular videos is just like of cats, you know. <laughs> and the way I got there was just asking ChatGPT, like, what are the most common searched things on YouTube? Like, what are the most c- common categories? what are the most common things within those categories? So, you know, it would say like pets and like, what are the most common things within that category? And it'd be like Mm. cats, dogs, you know, and list all the different pets. And then I would go to ChatGPT and say, okay, create a shot list of cat videos. And it would take maybe, I don't know, like an hour or two to come come up with all of the stuff for it. And then you edit it together and it would get like the most number of views or whatever. And then I'll spend like literally 80 hours putting together right. a tutorial that gets like, you know, right. 300, 400 views. And it's like, oh, but well, that's, to your okay. point, it's about the creation piece of it. I just enjoy the creative process. Yeah. Like the the creation is why I do it, not the, the, the end piece. So for me, as long as I can do the creation part, I'm happy, you know. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, you know, have to get honest with themselves as far as why they're doing it. Because it, it takes a, a lot of work. I mean, you're spending 10, 12-hour mm-hmm. days, you know, doing this stuff for weeks. Um, and so do you love doing it or is it you want to be famous, you know, I, <laughs> or something mm-hmm. like that? And I would have that even writing books or whatever. I'd have people go, you know, I could tell who really wanted to be a, like a writer and and wanted the craft and stuff and love the craft or those who wanted to become famous writers or you know like like they had mm-hmm. you know I'll do it but you know I got to be famous if I'm going to do it so it's just like you have to get honest with yourself because there's a lot easier ways to get famous and get attention than to do this stuff I mean there's a lot some of them are illegal but there's a lot of ways to do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's great yeah um well I think I think you're way ahead of the curve on this stuff in terms of fusing storytelling and um, AI technologies together to tell like really interesting stories. And I I know the world's going to catch up with you someday. I know you just published one, but do you already have an idea for the next video that you want to do? I have so many ideas. And so it usually comes down to like, I'll say like, oh, this will be my next one. But then another one might come for because you know the creative process is like pregnancy or something where you don't know when you're ready to go into labor with it so one that might pop forward and be like oh I'm ready like you thought I wasn't as you know developed with it so once I'm done with a project you know I might take three days to relax or whatever and unwind but then another one will start percolating in this situation and I said this when I announced uh, uh Grio I you know the, like you said people catching up to you you know the Hollywood people have found me once again and I've been asked to work on something AI related there. So, you know, I'm going to spend a little time on that. It, they presented a couple of things and I found one project that I was like, okay, this I can work with or whatever. So that's helpful. And they gave me a good talking to him. I was like, you don't have to do anything if you don't want to, um, which, you know, I felt that I would have, I felt that I'd feel pressure or be like, oh, it's all, you know, this is what everybody wants. Da, da, da. But I found something that kind of might work a little bit. So. I have to put on the back burner a little bit that, but I'm, I'm really, really excited about this uh, biblical uh, story that I, I want to tell. Um, so when I start up again, do, creating stuff that I could show, which, you know, hopefully will be sooner than later, I think it's going to be a biblical tale of epic proportions. Mm, 
I'm looking forward to it already. I feel like a biblical tale of epic proportions told in the style of Tasha Caulfield is like, yeah, I'm in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let me know when it's ready. See, this is what I've been, this is like, that's the thing. People who like the way I think, like the way I present it, because it's so easy to get caught up in a genre and people expecting things. It's a longer route. It's a slower route when you have a Renaissance personality for people to, to get consistent love like that. But I'm, I'm really starting to experience uh that for certain people who are really just like into you know me as a creative and that's really fun Mm -hmm. very cool well where can people if if they if they're not already following you where's where can people find you what's the best way to um follow along your journey here i f's with x formerly known as twitter (laughs) and um (laughs) and my handle is at tasha caulfield so that's the main way and there will be a link to all of your to your YouTube and your your X. Oh, yes. It's so I I just want to say Twitter. I'm going to say Twitter to your Twitter <laughs> and to your um, YouTube and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, but it's twenty years. I'm like, what is this, this Twitter well. they speak of? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know it, it's one of those things that it, like it'll make me sound old if if you say Twitter. Yeah. It's not Twitter. It's X. Right. You know. It's like oh, fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being a guest. And I hope you'll come back again um, sometime Ooh. and talk about some of the other stuff you're doing in the future. It would be really fun to, to uh, stay in touch with you throughout your creative journey with AI here. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for the invite back. I definitely would do this again. It's, it's, you're, you're, doing, you're doing really good. I mean, I'm impressed. I don't want to do any other ones but this. <laughs> <laughs> you spoiled me Excellent. now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. And hopefully for you, listener, it's been a pleasure as well. Thank you again for listening. If you enjoy conversations with AI creators like this, don't forget to subscribe. And until next time, keep generating.